Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's UW Showcase Talk. My name is Kate Preen, and on behalf of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, the Capital Lakes Retirement Community, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, we are delighted that you have joined us tonight. Tonight, you're going to hear from Jamie Stoltenberg. She grew up in Wisconsin, received her undergrad and master's degrees from UW-Milwaukee. However, she's been on this campus for almost 11 years, so she's pretty much a Badger at heart now. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jamie Stoltenberg. Thank you. I turned this on. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, I'm going to try and talk louder then. How's that? So thank you for having me. I am excited to be here to talk about one of my favorite subjects, maps and aerial photography, which I guess is a good thing considering what I've been doing for the last 13 years of my career. Um, I've spent the last 13 years um, focused on curating, preserving, and providing access to cartographic resources of all formats, um, some of which I'd like to talk with you um, today about. So we'll get started. So in a nutshell, um, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Science Hall. I often have a hard time doing presentations about the map library and our collections without at least mentioning the wonderful building that we reside in on the UW campus. And of course, Professor Robinson, who uh, the library is named after, and um, some details about the types of collections that we have in the Robinson Map Library. And when it comes to the section on aerial photography, I'll probably spend more time talking about that um, than the other things. We have a significant, comprehensive collection of historic aerial photographs of Wisconsin in the Robinson Map Library. Um, it's one of the things that really draws people to our collections. Um, and so if you'll bear with me a little bit, I'd like to also share with you um, an interesting story about the history of the aerial photography program in the United States, because I think it's a really fascinating story. Uh, I loved doing the research to prepare for this talk. I found out so many interesting things about that program, and the fact that Wisconsin plays sort of a significant role in some of that, I think, is really meaningful. Um, and then, of course, we'll have to take a look at some of the aerial views of the print aerial photographs in our collection. So we'll take a look at some of the images dating all the way back to 1937 and how those sort of compare and contrast with the imagery of today. So we'll be able to really get a sense of how the landscapes in Wisconsin have changed over time. So we'll begin with Science Hall. Hopefully some of you, if not all of you, have been there or seen it or ex had a class in there potentially. Um, science Hall is, um, this, the current Science Hall that we're in is actually the second Science Hall on the UW-Madison campus. So I'm not sure how much of the history of Science Hall that you know, um, but the first Science Hall was actually built in 1875. And it was the second instructional facility on the UW campus after Bascom Hall. It burned to the ground in 1884 um, as the result of a fire in the engine room that qu quickly spread and basically rendered the entire building um, unsavable. And I will quote to you uh, from Science Hall of the First Century, which was written by Clarence Olmsted, um, a, a direct quote from the record of the Board of Regents um, regarding that fire. I think it's, it's kind of an interesting quote. On the night of December 1st last, at about 8 o'clock, a fire broke out in the engine room at Science Hall and steadily pursued its course until the interior of said building and the destructible contents thereof were consumed, leaving walls only standing, and the engine, boiler, and machinery in a more or less damaged condition. Owing to the fact that the appliances at the building for putting out fires could not be reached by those persons who were early at the fire, and the utterly useless help afforded by the fire department of the city of Madison, nothing was done to stay the progress of the fire, and it simply burned out. The cause of the fire is entirely unknown to your committee. And Olmsted includes in a footnote at the end um, from that Board of Regents report, apparently the Madison Fire Department assumed that the alarm was a student prank and did not respond until it was too late. Sort of unfortunate. Um, so the current science hall that, we're, that we currently occupy was completed in 1888. It turned 125 years old last year. We had a huge party. It was wonderful. 
Um, and I have to share with you my favorite quote about this uh, current science hall building, which apparently people have kind of a love-hate relationship with. Um, I'm definitely on the love side of that. I think it's a wonderful building. I think it's beautiful. Um, but not everybody have, has appreciated its sort of architectural design. So in 1920, historian J.F.A. Pyer characterized the new science hall in this way. The largest, most useful, most expensive, and easily the ugliest building the university had yet acquired, Science Hall will doubtless stand indefinitely a monument to the prosperity, progressiveness, bad taste, and good intentions of the late 80s. So I think those of us who are lucky enough to have our offices in Science Hall love it and treasure its legacy on our campus. And at one time, it of course housed all of the sciences and engineering on campus. Now it is home to the Department of Geography and the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. The Robinson Map Library. Up on the third floor in the north wing, we occupy the entire north wing of the third floor in room 310. Uh, is named for Professor Arthur H. Robinson, who taught cartography at UW from 1945 to 1980. It's home to over a half a million items, and it's administratively part of the Department of Geography. Professor Robinson first organized the UW Map Library in the mid-1940s, after he returned from a post with the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Robinson was chief of the mapping division of the OSS, where he led that division in creating reference and thematic maps of significant places in the world during the war. Our library began with the collection of maps he brought to Madison with him in 1945 as he began his teaching career. In addition to starting the map library, Professor Robinson is credited with founding the UW Cartography Lab, which is still a successful map production facility, and the State Cartographer's Office, both of which reside in the Department of Geography in Science Hall. So there are quite a few of us in the Geography Department that owe our careers to Professor Robinson, so I'll thank him right now for that. Professor Robinson wrote several foundational textbooks in geography and cartography, and in 1963, he developed the Robinson Map Projection in response to an appeal from the Rand McNally Company, which has used the projection in several general purpose world maps since that time. The National Geographic Society also used the Robinson Projection as its default world projection for all maps printed between 1988 and 1998. Robinson said this about his approach to developing the map projection. I decided to go about it backwards. I started with a kind of artistic approach. I visualized the best looking shapes and sizes. I worked with the variables until I got it to a point where if I changed one of them, it didn't get any better. Then I figured out the mathematical formula to produce the effect. Most map makers start with the mathematics. So he was all of these things. He was an artist, he was a mathematician, cartographer, educator, and leader in the academic field of geography. So now that we have sort of the history of the science hall, the space, and Professor Robinson, the person, we'll talk a little bit more about the collection. So as I mentioned, we have cartographic items of all different formats, including bound volumes. So we do have books, we have atlases, gazetteers, globes, digital data, maps, navigation charts, plat books. Um, I'll talk about these four in more detail. Gazetteers essentially are a critical reference aid for finding different places in the world. You may have used these. Basically what they are are an alphabetical list of cities, towns, and villages in different countries around the world that give us the exact geographic location of those places. So they give us the latitude and longitude, so then we can take that information and find a map sheet or a series of map sheets, and then find that latitude and longitude and sort of narrow where that place would be on the map. And so these are really, really critical reference pieces that we use in the library every day. They have um, historic place names, so oftentimes places that maybe because of war or other political reasons, certain places don't exist um, on current maps. And so we can actually use these to find historic place names, um, to find uh, places that are no longer on current maps. 
And while the collection scope of the Robinson Map Library is worldwide, we do have strengths in maps of Wisconsin, Dane County, and the city of Madison. Most academic map collections have regional strengths. So these are just some examples of um, some of the Wisconsin maps in the collection. We have a significant number of them. And we like to say that the map collection is more contemporary in nature because Ro Professor Robinson started the collection in the 1940s. There was really very little effort to sort of go back retrospectively and start collecting really old historical maps. And so we leave that sort of thing to the Wisconsin State Historical Society, which is right across the street from us. They have an extensive map collection that has some wonderful maps of Wisconsin. A lot of their things have been digitized and are up online, which is wonderful. And um, the American Geographical Society's map collection moved from New York City in 1980 to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And that map collection is the second largest map collection after the Library of Congress in the Western Hemisphere. So only 70 miles away from here, they have an amazing collection of historic maps. Um, their oldest manuscript map is from 1452. It's, they have just an amazing collection of historic materials. And so we like to characterize ourselves as more of a contemporary collection. The library also has a strong collection in European map sets at various scales, including the British Ordnance Survey, one, to, one inch equals one statute miles series, various editions. We have amazing series for Germany, Poland, the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the turn of the century, including portions of Austria, Hungary, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, large parts of Serbia and Romania, and smaller parts of Italy, Montenegro, Poland, and the Ukraine. These are examples of the map indexes that we use. This is kind of um, a closer view of the Austro-Hungarian map index. This is at a scale of one to 75,000, so it's fairly detailed. Basically, each one of those squares with a number is an individual map sheet in the series. And so we use the index map to sort of narrow our geographic location to try to figure out which sheet is going to show the area that the patron is interested in. We draw these dashed lines through the boxes to indicate which sheets the map library has. And so we do have some indexes where the, the hash marks are incomplete because we don't have all of the sheets. This is an example of the Budapest sheet from that 1 to 75,000 series. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see the level of detail included in these. Oftentimes, we can see actual structures delineated. Um, again, these maps are roughly from late 1800s to about 1912 or so. Um, we can actually see, um, we can see cemetery locations, we can see vegetation types, we can start to depict some kind of land use um, in some of these images. This is a, a Litchfield sheet from the Great Britain Ordnance Survey. These are really popular maps. The oldest series we have is, again, roughly turn of the century, um, but it's a facsimile series, which doesn't really matter because the information is still really valuable. Um, it's just not an original series. This is a little um, zoomed in view of Litchfield. And on these maps, oftentimes if, um, when genealogists are doing family research, um, family names often, or family farms often listed the names on these maps. And so you can actually see family names indicated if there is a certain amount of land owned by a particular family or a prominent farm owned by a particular family. So these maps um, are used a lot in genealogical research done at the library. And plat books, you've probably seen these and used these. We have a, a contemporary collection of plats. We only collect them for Wisconsin. Um, so we, we continue to buy current plat books. We have them through 2013, 2014 for just about every county in Wisconsin. Our oldest plat is the Dane County 1947 edition. Um, this is a sort of a zoomed in view of the town of Fitchburg. Um, and you've probably used these to sort of track um, how land ownership has changed over time or if you wanted to see parcels of land um, that your family may have owned in, in the past. These are really great because obviously they show the owner name right over the parcel, um, where these, um, these little arrows sort of, sort of show contiguous 40-acre parcels owned by the same person. So again, for genealogy or personal research, um, these can really be valuable because they show uh, ownership and family names. 
And I'll mention just briefly that in addition to all of the physical collections, so the things that we, that we buy or we get as gifts or that come in um, through uh, library depository programs that take up space in the library, we also do collect and curate um, digital geospatial data. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years. Basically, we seek out county and municipal government data in Wisconsin. So these are things that um, municipal and county governments are recording, digitizing, things like tax parcels and assessment data, street networks, zoning information, land use. Um, and our students and faculty and researchers use these in their cartography and geographic information systems courses to do computer-based analysis on these. So basically they can take all of these layers of information, bring them together in a computer and use that to answer questions um, about land use planning or site selection or a lot of other things. So we have about a terabyte of data in the archive in the library and this is one of the most heavily used parts of our collection today. Um, it's really sort of cutting edge kind of emerging um, geospatial collections. So with that, I'm going to move on to aerial photographs, which is my favorite part. Um, so we have a really impressive collection of aerial photographs. And I, to be honest with you, um, came into the collection being what it is. So I'm not taking any credit for <laughs> developing the historic aerial photo collection. Um, we did add about 40 to 50,000 images since I've been there. Um, but the collection really is just amazing. It's the largest archive of historic aerial photographs in Wisconsin. Um, the entire collection totals about 260,000 individual nine inch by nine inch contact prints. Um, and these images date back to the 1930s. Um, they're primarily photographs taken by the United States Department of Agriculture early on, but we do have imagery taken by the United States Geological Survey um, by different county land offices. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin, the Forestry Division does a lot of aerial photography work, um, as well as the Department of Transportation, maybe more so in the 50s and 60s when there was a lot of highway development as well. Um, so this collection is something that really draws people to the library for various reasons. And so thinking about how people use aerial imagery, um, I'll just talk about a couple of these. These are some of the more common ones that we see in the library on a daily basis. Um, but site selection is a really common one. So when a piece of commercial property is set to be developed, there has to be a thorough report of the history of what happened on that parcel of land throughout time. So for example, if it's a vacant parcel now, but in a 1955 aerial photograph, there is a gas station located there. Even if that building is no longer there, there may be fuel tanks underground that a developer may need to deal with or do some research to figure out how to deal with um, prior to any kind of construction or development work. And so these, are, these reports are, are um, required before development can happen. And in legal cases, we get a lot of people from all over the state that come and use the collection because they have their rural landowners and they have some kind of dispute with their neighbor um, who's trying to either take acreage from them or <laughs> try to redefine their property lines. And so oftentimes outdated property deeds describe boundaries of parcels using feature examples like roads or rail lines or fence lines that are no longer there. And so oftentimes in a court case situation, if someone can prove using aerial photography that those features were there and they can accurately delineate the boundary of that parcel, um, photography can be really useful in those, those kinds of scenarios. And really just seeing how places in our state looked almost 80 years ago can be really amazing. Tracking family histories through property ownership, seeing old farms, old buildings, fields before subdivisions went in, cities before major highways were built. It brings back memories and reminds us of how things used to be. But it also can let us soak in the wonderful details of features that remain largely unchanged. And we'll look at some examples of that. So if you will bear with me for a couple slides, um, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the history of the USDA 
aerial photography program in this country um, and kind of bring it back to Wisconsin's collections and what that means for, for the collections in our library. So we have to go all the way back to 1862 when President Abraham Lincoln founded the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He called it the People's Department. And in Lincoln's day, 48% of those people were farmers who needed good seeds and information to grow their crops. Fast forward to the 1930s when the Great Depression hit farmers harder than it did most other Americans. Falling prices for produce and livestock encouraged increased production, which further led to lower prices. Between 1929 and 1932, the net income of the average farm operator fell 69% according to the U.S. Census. Without higher and stable prices, those farmers that did remain faced a bleak future. Elected in late 1932, President Roosevelt made the Agricultural Adjustment Act one of the first legislative proposals under the New Deal. Two months after Roosevelt took office in May of 1933, Congress established the Agricultural Adjustment Administration to oversee the program. Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace's vision of the ever normal granary was propelled into action via the AAA, where it focused on controlling production through voluntary contracts with growers. The AAA was to establish and maintain a balance between production and consumption of agricultural commodities. In practice, this objective resulted in an attempt to reduce the amount of land in production by paying farmers not to produce seven basic commodities, cotton, wheat, corn, rice, tobacco, hogs, and dairy, using revenue generated by a tax on commodity processors. But because the government couldn't order farmers to plant less, New Deal planners devised a voluntary acreage reduction program with incentives, local control, and surveillance procedures for promoting fairness and preventing cheating. And a primary source of New Deal surveillance was aerial photography. But in 1936, the Supreme Court ruled the tax imposed on commodity producers commodity processors was unconstitutional. Congress quickly adopted a conservation program which utilized grants to pay farmers to switch from soil depleting to soil conserving crops. A leader in soil conservation in the early 1930s, Wisconsin was home to the very first soil erosion study by another newly created New Deal agency called the Soil Erosion Service. The Coon Creek Watershed Soil Erosion Control Demonstration in Western Vernon County was hugely successful and sparked additional erosion control demonstrations across rural America. Following that, Wisconsin's first comprehensive USDA aerial photo flight took place from 1937 and lasted through 1941. Photography was used to monitor compliance with these conservation incentive programs. Whether focused on conservation or production controls, New Deal farm policy depended on accurate measurements of field size at the farm level. In the 1860s, precise survey measurements were made by carrying chains around a farmer's field, and then the maps were drawn by hand. A more accurate, inexpensive, and efficient method was needed to measure the millions of acres of farmland across the United States. The use of aerial photographs to calculate acreage would replace that awkward method. In 1937, studies began on the effectiveness and accuracy of utilizing aerial photos as a proxy for measuring actual field sizes with a tool called a planimeter. And in the early 1940s, the USDA established two aerial photography labs, one in North Carolina and the other in Utah, to do this work. In addition to the various ways people used historic aerial photos that I mentioned earlier, current imagery remains an essential tool in managing farm programs today. One meter resolution national aerial imagery program photography helps the USDA manage and administer common land units. Local aerial projects help county and municipal governments 
map their cities, towns, and villages in an effort to modernize land records like tax parcels, transportation, and land use. You can view and download digital Wisconsin aerial imagery from 2002 to the present by visiting wisconsinview.org, an online repository of remotely sensed imagery managed in the Space Science and Engineering Center at UW-Madison. Okay, so now that we have the history of the program, thank you for bearing with me on that. So let's take a look at what some of these images look like. So we'll begin, this might be hard for you to see. Does, any, does anybody know where this is? Can anybody tell? Maybe this helps. Can you see what's circled? Yeah, this is, this is the Platte Mound M, largest M in the world, which I love. Um, constructed of whitewash limestone, it signifies mining in the School of Mines at, the, at UW Platteville. The M was completed in 1937 and was lit on fire to celebrate homecoming on October 16th of that same year. So this is just one example of how we can visualize historic and cultural features across Wisconsin's landscapes using aerial photography. Our second example, hopefully a place you all are extremely familiar with, this is part of the UW campus in 1937 and on the right in 2010. And so instantly we find our eyes going to things that we notice that are similar, correct? Such as Camp Randall. <laughs> and then after we kind of orient ourselves and figure out you know, where we are between the two images, you'll start to see some of the subtle differences appear between the two. So it's kind of interesting. There's not a ton that's visible at the scale of this image. Um, actually, if you move just slightly west towards West Campus, there's a lot a bigger change in the two images because as you move west, it's just completely, you know, farm fields and sort of barren as, as it compared to today. Our next example of urban change, see if anybody knows where this is. I don't know if this helps at all. This is Green Bay, right. So in an area that was once home to several family farms in 1937, until Lambeau Field opened in 1957, we see dramatic change in Green Bay from 1937 to 2010 through rapidly expanding residential communities. And this is my favorite example because I'm from Milwaukee. Um, in 1937, the site of the future county stadium in Milwaukee is peppered with small recreational baseball fields, which I like to think is not just a coincidence. Construction of County Stadium was completed in 1953. The Milwaukee Braves played their first home game at County Stadium on April 6th of that year and played there until they left Milwaukee in 1966. The Brewers played their first game there in 1970 and their last game in 2000 when Miller Park opened in 2001. It's amazing to see all of the changes here, but still our eye notices the similarities in an effort to orient ourselves between the two images. So this is the difference between 2007 and 1963. So County Stadium, which of course is, was in where the parking lot is now of Miller Park. So I think there's a little um, brass plate in the, in the parking lot that signifies where home plate of County Stadium was. <laughs> if you go to Miller Park, you have to walk around and find it. Maybe someone should GPS it, then we know where it is. So there and back again, it can be a thing of beauty to see dramatic change to a landscape that eventually returns to its original pristine condition, or almost original pristine condition. Case in point, the Badger Army Ammunition Plant, or Badger Ordnance Works in Sauk County. This is that site in 1937. In 1941, despite protests from those living in Sauk Prairie, President Roosevelt authorized the funds to build the plant and by March of 1942, the farmers who lived there had left and construction of the facility began. This is the site in 1949. The plant ceased operation in 1975 and the land is being reclaimed. In April of this year, the DNR opened the land to the public for recreation and turkey hunting. More reclamation work will be done to the property as the DNR gathers input from public stakeholders on future land use options. So we see this 
kind of return to maybe close to what it was. I don't know if you can really go all the way back, but it's an interesting cycle sometimes. An image from above of cranberries in Wood County, the number one cranberry producing county in Wisconsin with over 4,000 acres of marshlands. From 1938 to 2008, we see little change in the geometric beauty of this landscape. The soil erosion control practice of strip cropping, as seen from above, is a work of art. Little change is also seen here in a section of rural Lafayette County between 1968 and 2000. New Wisconsin DNR aerial photography, which is flown in black and white infrared, allows the vegetation to come alive, and the contrast in the strip cropping is particularly eye-catching. And I want to mention that you can access any of these historical images in print if you visit the map library. We're happy to help people anytime. Um, we can make photocopies, we can make scans of them, we can help you find your area of interest. It's very easy to do. Um, but you can also access a large portion of this collection on the web. So the entire 1937 to 1941 initial USDA aerial survey of Wisconsin, it's over 38,000 images that make up that collection, um, are all online. They've all been digitized and they're all online. Um, the library received a Baldwin Wisconsin Idea Endowment grant in 2008 um, for a three-year project to digitize that entire series of aerial photos. And so you can do this from any computer. You just need an internet connection and you can get access to that entire collection, that entire historical record, which is really, really amazing. So there's a couple of different things you can do here. You can do a location search. So you, if you have a place that you wanna see, you could type in the city. If you're looking for Fort Atkinson, for example, you could just type that in. I helped a gentleman find photos of Fort Atkinson today. That's why it's in my head. Um, you can zoom to a county. You can type in the legal description of the property. So if you know the township range and section, um, of the property, you can use that. And once you get to an area that you'd like to see historic imagery for, um, you can start to see the thumbnails pop up and you can actually bring those 1937 photos into the current map view. So we're looking at um, that base map image, which is just a Bing Maps, you know, it's a 2014 image of Wisconsin. Um, we can bring in that 1937 photo and then actually use the transparency to fade the image um, in and out so that you can actually kind of look at how that land has changed over time, kind of right on top of each other, which is kind of an amazing visualization to be able to do. Um, so with that, I have some closing thoughts. Um, I hope that you'll visit the map library. Again, we're in Science Hall up on the third floor. Um, I think maps and aerial photos appeal to our sense of place, both present and past. We use maps to navigate effectively from one place to another, but we also use them to connect with places and memories of our past. They allow us to travel back in time and look at places from our own histories that are meaningful and personal, and allow us to illustrate our own life stories geographically. We have so many cartographic treasures in the Robinson Map Library, so this is my official invitation to you to come and explore this amazing collection. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you, Jamie. I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll come around with the microphone. People have any? I hope I didn't talk too fast. I was trying to slow it down, but it was only 35 minutes. So we have a lot of time for questions, if people have any. Yeah. Could you go back to that <clears throat> Robinson projection? Yeah. It said 38 degrees was the standard. Okay. And I'm wondering if you could just talk more about that and what it meant when it showed uh, like a kind of distortion at higher latitudes? So his, um, you know, we have, a, we have a whole thing on our website about how he developed the projection. <laughs> um, yeah, 
So his, um, the reason that national, that's the reason that National Geographic abandoned using his projection was because of the polar distortion. And so they went to, I believe, the Van der Grinten, or maybe they went from the Van der Grinten. I have it in my notes somewhere of what they went to. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm not particularly sure on the mathematical calculations that he used for it. Um, he really did it in an unconventional way, which is why I included that quote about how he approached it sort of backwards, was that he did the math kind of after the fact. Like he wanted something that preserved the shape and the size of the countries and the continents of the world. That was his ultimate goal, is that he wanted a projection that made the world with every continent shown in one space look good. So, you know, people talk about the Mercator projection, how Greenland looks absolutely huge, but it was because it was based on, you know, true north and south navigation. Um, so he used a, a different formula to kind of, you know, basically eliminate that size distortion in a different way. But other than that, I don't know a whole lot about the, the math, unfortunately. It, uh, is, uh, explained in the website. We do have it information on the website. Mm -hmm. and Yep, geography.wis.edu. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. so what is the uh, email reference for us to get that latest information on the, the 37 to 41 historic base? Oh, um, well, let me actually, I can. Was it wisconsinview.org? Wisconsinview.org is the URL for the current aerial imagery. So if you're interested in looking at Anything from 2002 to present. What about the history then? Or about the, the historic ones are, um, you, the easiest way for you to get to them is to go to the Map Library's website. I don't know if I have an internet connection here. No. Um, is to go to the Map Library's website. I don't know if I have the URL. Or you can email me too. Uh, so again, just geography.wisc.edu. Um, oh, here, I do have the Wayfinder URL up here. This, is, this website URL is um, for the 1937 to 1941 historic aerial photos. There's also a, a direct link to that collection from <coughs> the Map Library's website. So if you just Googled Robinson Map Library, it will take you there. Um, or go to geography.wisc.edu, you'll find us there as well. So, and feel free to um, email me if you have any questions. Um, once you get into the Wisconsin Historic Aerial Image Finder, a lot of people have questions once they get in to try to find specifically what it is they're looking for. And I'm in charge of doing all of the reference and support for that online collection. So I'm happy to help with that. I'm interested in water resources mm -hmm. in the area where the proposed mining will be and mm. just north of that. And I'm wondering how well the aerial photography can show things like streams and waterfalls and so on that uh, could be important, but I'm wondering if they show up, if one could tell from one of these maps what resources of that type are available? Absolutely. Water features are actually one of the easiest things to depict from historic aerial imagery um, because of the reflectance of the water. So um, I would say that it would be a fantastic resource for that. It would just depend on the vintage of imagery that you're looking for and how complete our collections are for the, the year that you're interested in. Um, obviously, all of the current aerial imagery of that area is available online on wisconsinview.org, but we would have imagery from 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and maybe things have changed since that time in that area. I'm not sure, but it would be very useful to use imagery for that, that purpose. So come to the library and I can definitely help you with that. <laughs> I assume you have the kinds of maps that show uh, population mm -hmm. and um, poverty, uh, economic maps. 
other than the kind of maps and aerial photography you were showing us? We do, um, although a lot of that information mapped by the Census Bureau, the Census of Population and Housing, since the 2000 decennial census is only released electronically. So um, we, don't have, we don't get printed maps from the Department of Commerce that depict the current state of population and statistical data in the United States. Um, and so all of that stuff, we have to point researchers and users to information that's available online for it. Um, but we have the historic maps. So we have 1990, 1980, 1970 historical population atlases and things like that. So people typically use our print collections for the historical research um, work. And then we try to point them to the digital resources. Almost every agency of the federal government is pushing out their information purely in electronic format, in digital formats. So the map library is actually a federal depository collection. So we get every cartographic item that any federal agency produces um, comes to the library and we have to keep it indefinitely and make it available to the public. And in the 11 years that I've been there, we've seen a huge decline in the amount of print material from federal agencies. It's all being served on the web, which I think is good in terms of how many people can access it, um, but bad in terms of an archival standpoint because we worry a little bit about um, how long are they gonna keep this information up? And if we have something that we can file away and we know it's there and no one's gonna take it, um, that's sort of warming to librarians. <laughs> um, but if it's something that just exists in the digital world and we, you know, it's up to somebody else to make sure that it's archived for the long term, it's, you know, there are some questions with that. So um, the Census Bureau, every time there's a decennial census, they remove um, they only keep two decennial censuses available online, so you can get 2000 and 2010, and anything prior to that is not available through their portal. So, the demography library, has that. The demography library would probably have um, archived copies of the digital data, and there's um, the Applied Population Laboratory at UW Madison is a wonderful resource for. Um, um, sort of working with Wisconsin demographic data and serving that out to the public and helping users with historical information as well. So. Now I'm wondering about the ability we have to correct inaccuracies that may have been introduced with surveys now that we have these super accurate maps based on aerial photography. Yeah. Uh, is that an issue that you're active in resolving when there's an extra little sliver of land here or there? Um, not me personally, but it's an issue that is brought up regularly in professional organizations that I'm a member of. So the Wisconsin Land Information Association, which includes county municipal government, land records administrators, county surveyors, um, things like that. I think that when when county governments and city governments use aerial photos as a basis for mapping, there's still a margin of error that they're dealing with. Um, and they always recommend that you, you know, have a parcel of land professionally surveyed for the most accurate um, survey of that property. So that utilizing even, you know, like the history of the aerial photography where they're using the sort of proxy to measure fields, there's some margin of error that's automatically built into that. Um, but it's, it's an issue that um, people in you know, much closer fields than, than me are dealing with regularly. Mm -hmm. From what elevations are the photos taken and how is that selected? Um, so they vary. Um, most of the, the scales of the photography in the collection are at 1 to 20,000. Um, we have some high altitude collections. It just depends on Basically, it just depends on the year. That's how we, we kind of organize it. So in the 1970s and 1980s, um, we have a lot of high altitude imagery. So it's a, a little bit less useful for people um, because everything is really tiny because the plane is really, really high. Um, but they can cover a lot more area for a lot less cost doing it that way because it's less prints, right, to cover a, a specific area. Um, so all of the 1930s and 40s aerial photos are 1 to 20,000. The 50s aerial photos are 1 to 20,000. 
Um, all of the DNR forestry imagery that we have is, is at 1 to 15, 840. So that's actually the best, most detailed scale that we have is, is basically the DNR forestry division aerial photography. And they basically fly, I think, um, a quadrant of the state every five years. Um, the latest collection of imagery we have from them is from 2010. And I'm not sure beyond 2010 how much more print imagery they're going to be obtaining because you know the, the foresters are now used to using the digital imagery as well. So once it's in digital format, there, there's a scale of resolution of the pixel size of the image. And it's for the federal programs, it's one meter resolution. So if you zoomed in close enough to actually measure a pixel in that imagery, it would be one meter across. Um, some of our counties and municipalities are flying six inch imagery, which is really detailed. You can see a lot. It can be creepy in a way, but, <laughs> but it's really useful for people using it for mapping. So. Yeah. Um, the um, seasons of dining room here at Castle Lake, oh. uh, owned some of Craig Wilson, I guess you would say low altitude photography. Oh. His uh, cameras are on Kite. <gasps> nice. And he has uh, two books out of his photography, endless guns. And oh, very cool. Yeah, I don't think we do. Photographs, but that, that's a very different right. view. Right. Of, I mean, it is, I guess, low altitude is what you would say. Yeah, and right, and capital. sure. And a lot of those images oftentimes can be um, oblique views. So you're actually seeing things from the side, depending on how the camera is mounted. It's not always looking straight down vertically, which can be kind of challenging sometimes to, to make things out. Um, but there's so many things like that happening. There was a balloon mapping project recently on campus. So you'll see these balloons kind of going up and people are <laughs> collecting you know, aerial imagery of different places. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. I'll have to check to see if we have those books. Our geography library in Science Hall might actually have them. We don't have a whole lot of books, to be honest with you. Our primary format is sheet maps. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you know the history of the development of quadrangles, or we call them green lines more commonly? Were they from visuals or from uh, aerial photos, or what was the um, source of it? The quad, like the U.S. geologic quadrangles, the topographic maps, are you referring to? Or is that what you're referring to? Yeah, and contour lines. Yeah, so, so those would be, um, those were all derived from aerial imagery. Well, after aerial imagery was a thing, of course. Um, I can't really speak to the topographic mapping practices, you know, prior to that, because that's not really my area of expertise. But um, one thing I should mention with that is that all of the USGS topographic maps, so the 1 to 24,000 scale, really detailed maps of every quadrangle in the country, basically every state in the country, there's, I think, a little over 2,000 individual quadrangles that cover the state of Wisconsin. Um, all of those maps have been digitized by USGS and are online. Um, the person that uh, headed up that original project was a graduate of our department at UW and is based out of Madison, um, out of the USGS office here, and used our collection as the pilot for that national scanning effort. So um, if you go online and you download topographic maps from the USGS of Wisconsin, they're all from the Robinson Collection, so they all have our stamp on them. But I, I know that um, there's notes in the margins on those where it indicates the year of the photography that the topography and vegetation was derived from. Um, but prior to using aerial imagery on the backs of the sheets that date back to the turn of the century, like we have the Madison 1904 quadrangle, for example, um, there's information on the back about how that information was collected and what the symbols mean and things like that. So, Could you just speak briefly about the difference between aerial photography and satellite imagery and the advantages and disadvantages? 
So it used, there used to be a, a lot more differences than there are today. So typically in the past, um, obviously satellite imagery is from a satellite, which is really, really high up in space. Um, and aerial imagery was taken from a camera mounted on an airplane, um, which was often at a much better resolution because it's inherently lower. Um, but today that's really not the case and you can get satellite imagery that is as good or better in terms of resolution as aerial imagery. So it's typically really, really expensive um, and it's largely controlled by the private sector. I mean, none of our public agencies or, or, or government agencies are, are using satellites to collect aerial imagery because it's not um, economical for them to do that. Um, but the technology there today with satellite imagery in terms of how refined and how close we can see things is pretty much equal to or sometimes better than aerial image than than aerial photography done from a plane. So is that sort of what you're so looking basically the cost I will never get it won't displace aerial photography. I, I think in I, the near future. Yeah, I mean I'm no expert on this, so take this with a huge grain of salt. <laughs> um, but my sense is that you know a satellite is a lot more expensive than mounting a camera on a plane, even though the the aerial imagery with you know an airplane is still expensive. Wisconsin has um, a consortium of counties that kind of band together and collect aerial imagery on the same intervals as a cost-saving measure. So it's, the, like the, it's called the Wisconsin Orthophoto Consortium. And so there's a group of counties that work with an imagery company to get their imagery taken all at the same time and then they pay much less for it as opposed to all 72 counties having it done at different times. So, and then we have consistent data sets as well across the state, you know, which seamless data layers for the same years going from county to county is really important. So for consistency. Anything else? Great, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. It.